Hi, it is Friday, November 30th, 2018. It is still 2018. Soon we will have to write checks. Wait, what's a check? Uh, with 2019 on them. And um, yeah, it's exactly. Uh, and this is the, uh, an inside Jerry's Brain call around the topic of how do we draw the line between kooky ideas and absolutely brilliant ideas that may not be provable today, that, that may not fit the, within the tolerance boundaries of what science approves of today, but may not be very crazy. So um, I will explain a little bit more about how, how we got here. But, but <clears throat> kind of as background, I, I, I'm interested in, I, I think personally, I'm, I'm, I, feel like, I feel like I'm trying to digest the universe and like, you know, <laughs> the meaning of the universe and everything. Um, and it's not 42, as far as I can tell. I've liked the universe and everything. There's the quote. Um, and in doing so, you run across a lot of fringy ideas, and some of them are you dismiss, and some of them you do not. And I think each of us draws that boundary differently. Each of us uh, makes decisions and has a background and is uh, has a belief system. Uh, and I, I'm especially interested in the beliefs behind the decisions, the things that would cause us to lean favorably toward uh, agreeing that something is plausible or possible uh, as opposed to impossible and should be, in fact, uh, is potentially dangerous. And I think this, this line between what's kooky, uh, this line between what's kooky and what's, what's like, like just a little bit outside that is actually brilliant uh, is a super important line for us to draw. And, and it, it, this is a layered process because this is hard individually just by ourselves looking at facts and trying going to school and reading books and doing whatever, this is a difficult line to draw just by ourselves. But then it's extremely important that we draw this line together. And arguably we've been doing that for, you know, a couple millennia since we've, since we've had discussions around the campfire or whatnot. Um, we've been trying to sort out what's real, what's not, including, you know, why are we here? Is there a God? Questions like that. But, but even simpler things about how things work and why people believe things, right? So doing this collectively is harder. It's, it's harder than just the individual inquiry because um, a lot of these belief systems drive things like government policy. And a lot of these belief systems are co-opted to drive stupid government policy for years and years and years. And we can, each of us, point to multiple historic examples in different countries at different times, uh, where at one point Mao creates the four pests campaign. One of the pests is sparrows. Well, there are just too many sparrows flying around China. So over the course of a couple of years, the Chinese citizens managed to kill off almost all the sparrows. And then there's a decade of famine because all of the insects that the sparrows were eating suddenly thrive and have a great time. They have no predator, et cetera, et cetera. And, and millions of people starve to death because of a policy decision based on a belief, based on meh, nonsense. Um, so these things are actually dangerous knowledge in the wrong hands and applied especially at scale in ways like that. And then to complicate matters just a little bit further, we are now in the era of post-truth. We are now in the era of factual conflict. And I will kind of add that um, I, I think, um, I, I think um, personally that we have slipped into uh, what seems to be called the nonlinear war. Um, that we are already in World War III and it is nonlinear, which means it's about information and uh, and it's not about dropping bombs and bullets. Uh, it is about illiberal democracy. Have you all heard the term illiberal democracy? Uh, illiberal democracy looks like democracy, smells like democracy, but isn't. Uh, there are votes and you know, people go and put ballots in boxes and there are votes, but the votes are mostly sort of rigged because the parties are suppressed. There is a press, there is journalism, but most of them are owned by the people who are being voted on. There is a judiciary, except the courts have been basically, you know, thumbs have been put on the scales everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So it looks like a democratic country, uh, but it ceases to be such over time. Uh, but the play acting of, of, of democracy is what the story is told to everybody. So, so how do we negotiate this line between what's a kooky theory and what's a precog theory, which is just a shorthand I'm using, I'd love better language for this. Um, how do we negotiate that line as we move forward going together? And I would love 
I would love for Inside Jerry's Brain as a little community of practice to develop a method to walk into these issues together with some openness and some just ju judgment and make some decisions on this. And I can say that I will reflect in my brain what I agree with and what I disagree with. And I would love to see other people's manifestations of same, uh, whether it's in essays or in other mapping tools or in whatever. I think, I think a, a really big piece of uh, why the brain is interesting to me here, and I'll just switch to some screen sharing. And uh, every, time I, every time I do some uh, braining on, on the inside Jerry's brain, I have to explain a little bit for anybody who's new, like how this brain thing works and, <clears throat> and why it is. So I, I basically, I, each node is called a thought. I created a thought for this uh, particular call. It's uh, the 1811 means 2018 November inside Jerry's brain call. And in fact, um, what I'm gonna do right now is connect that to, oh, my brain's acting a little slow because I've got Zoom and a browser and a bunch of too many, too many things going on. So IJB calls, I know I have a thought called inside Jerry, uh, Jerry's brain calls. So I'm going to link it. Oops, I had already linked it to that. Never mind. So um, this is one of multiple calls that we've that I've started hosting around this notion of inside Jerry's brain. So if I go back to the current thought, I've linked it to a series of other thoughts somewhere in my brain that I'd like to go through as part of our discussion. But the thing that I wanted to show right now um, is this thought that I have called my beliefs. And across the bottom of the brain, uh, this is basically a breadcrumb trail. Uh, as I click on a thought, you'll see it added to this list and then they scroll off to, to the left. Um, across the top is a pin board. So anything I, any thought I drag up to the top here stays here. So I've got a thought that's always here in the middle called my beliefs. I also have a thought that's always here which, with the current year. So in a month, I'm going to change this to 2019. Uh, here's what 2017 looked like. And each year I keep basically the significant, every event that happened during the year that was kind of caught the public attention was really interesting. So in 2017, Bitcoin passes 10,000, Bitcoin passes 16,000, Bitcoin passes 19,000, Bitcoin passes 7,000, uh, Catalan independence referendum, a bunch of other things. So if I go back to my beliefs, the reason I'm, I'm sort of screen sharing right now, um, I think that the beliefs behind all these decisions, behind the decisions we make about um, whether something is real or not, are, are really important. And the more we can externalize them, have interesting discussions about whether that's true or not. So I, I happen to believe that people <clears throat> that people are born um, that people are born good, meaning they're not born evil. Uh, so I think I have that over here. This is just an example I use, I think, a lot. But uh, there's, it's, it's perfectly legitimate to hold the belief that people are born bad. In fact, uh, entire religious systems, like original sin, is basically a notion that people are born with an original sin, <clears throat> right? And that we are fundamentally violent is a belief system. But these things lead to very different policy decisions from uh, other belief systems. So let me go back here, stop screen sharing and pause for a second just with that intro and see what you all are thinking as a result. Bill, Sky, Michael, <clears throat> excellent. Anybody who wants to jump in, please jump in. And a couple of you like Bill, um, I know, and Jean, um, our lifelong collectors of what you care about. You have been curating your own versions of a digital memory. Uh, this goes really deep for you. I, I happen to know that. Uh, so feel free to jump in and just uh, like, has that helped you? Bill, has SciteWeb been good for you? You're muted right now, by the way. Uh, still, I, now I, I can mean, hear you. There we go. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's well. Keeping me sane probably is one upside. Uh, <laughs> having an external brain helps uh, helps get stuff out of your own brain a little bit, and sort of helps uh, untangle ideas that are percolating around, uh, and then connect them to other things that you you know you start with an idea, and then all of a sudden you remember something from three years or. 
12 years prior that you were thinking, you know, another time in a different way. And so it helps to kind of revisit some of those things and decide uh, how your new ideas relate to your old ideas. All and of which I completely agree with. Yeah. And then, you know, sometimes it's about looking for a hook. If you're trying to turn something actionable, you know, again, you sometimes forget a good idea around that in the past or you realize you've sort of gone down bunny trails too many times. And so it sort of forces you to uh, sort of put some boundaries around your thinking and talk, you know, think about like, well, what are you really trying to accomplish and how might you do that? And it gives you like a fresh spin when you sort of see your previous fails to achieve, you know, orbital velocity. Exactly. Is websites.fluxent the best uh, yeah. address right now? Yeah. Right. So if I click on this link, it should launch my browser it might. To, to yours. Oops. Am oh, I, you, I just go within uh, slash wiki on there. Like that? Yep. There we go. Much better. So what I will do is I will um, copy that and update the link over here while we're talking, just because. Yep. That will help anybody who's browsing my brain find your <clears throat> web. Oops. And the, uh, the very first link on that page, coincidentally, is a current, you know, brain fart that I'm just sort of scratching at and saying, I have these ideas that I know are related in my head. Let me sort of write them down and pull some other things in and, you know, sort of get them into a scratch pad and try to think about um, where to go with that. So if you wanted to click into there, you'd sort of... On next open the, infrastructure? Yep. Awesome. <laughs> This is lovely. And, and thank you so much for thinking out loud for so long this way. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's great. I mean, it, it really helps to see how other people are puzzling through the same. My, my theory kind of is that we're all seeing the same flow of stuff because right. there's no, there's few barriers to access. There's a couple of paywalls, et cetera, but, but basically it's just a ton of info. What you attend to, what you attune to matters a whole bunch. And then how you process that is like the crux, right? What, what, where's the chaff? Where's the wheat? Um, can you be distracted by shiny objects? I'm always struck by the, like Jay Leno's man on the street interviews where he'll, he'll show people pictures of, of world leaders. They will have no idea who, but you ask them who Kim Kardashian is married to and they know, right? Right. They know all of it. They know how many babies are in there. They, 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 they know like the, the works and, and it's not that people are dumb. It's that people are distracted. People have the capacity to remember <coughs> insane amounts of things and to understand relationships and plot and yeah. Some like of the that. stuff, yeah, like uh, I, I know you've read a fair amount of Gatto also, and and he's got a whole rant about how like we assume that poor people can't make decisions. Like we have to have a public school monoculture because we can't trust poor people to evaluate something as complicated as the education for their children. And he's like, well, talk to those people about anything that they have to spend money on or a million other decisions that they make in the course of a day. And they bring all sorts of subtlety of thought and trade-offs and things into that. Uh, so it's ridiculous to think that they're not capable of doing that for the other stuff. It's about offering actual alternatives and, you know, making those differences more explicit to them so they can, you know, then decide how their own values and expectations for the future would drive that decision. Mm -hmm. There's a, a book, I'll look right now, um, Portfolios of the Poor, which uh, was published back, I don't, I don't have the date here, but back at least a decade, I think in which they basically presented, they did a whole bunch of, of research uh, around the world and they discovered that most poor people have an average of, did I put it in here? Nope, uh, I said many financial strategies, like something like 13 different strategies and instruments, your average poor person. So they might lend money to their cousin, they might keep money under the mattress, they might use payday lending, they might have a loan shark, they might be uh, paying off one credit card in order to, you know, it depends how poor you may not have a credit card at all, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that the, the degree of sophistication they were required to have to stay alive, it was shocking. And of course uh, the interest rates they, they faced and the fees they faced at every step on this path were brutal. So, so it's a complete uphill battle 
um, to get out of poverty. So we, we've gone, to, we've pursued this a, a little ways, but I want to come back to the, I, and I'm doing this sort of on purpose. I want to see, you know, I love the comparison between ways that you've been um, curating what you care about and how you investigate these ideas and ways that I do it. I think that's really, um, really like enlightening to our conversation. So mm -hmm. let me go back, turn off share. Um, Kirsty, welcome to the call. Yay. Um, and see where, um, what else does this bring up for people? Larry, I, Larry, Jerry, I, I would volunteer. Please. Just to get, kick, think, kick things off and because I may be pulled out of this at any given moment. Um, I'd volunteer that I actually retreated away from electronic uh, recording and storage media re fairly recently because I realized that they were a f that r that writing notes at a computer was really affecting my um, ability to remember those notes and to sort of pre-process uh, the ideas so it, it when I when I would take notes at a computer um, the notes would almost bypass any kind of processing here and they would go literally onto the screen and I thought that was good because I was I'm a fast typist and I'm able to keep up but I'm realizing that uh, trying to record my history in this electronic medium including the brain um, just isn't working for me uh, so so oddly here after you know, 20 or 30 years of computer use I've gone back to paper that's super interesting I, I'm very curious how other people have have addressed that because one thing I noticed, and this only in the last year, about my use of the brain in particular, is that curating things and putting them into my brain forces me to go into system two thinking about almost everything I run across. And so I have to make a series of conscious decisions. Is this worth remembering? Mm -hmm. Where does it go? Because I have to put it somewhere in the brain, which means what is it related to? When I put it in, what should I really call it? What else is it connected to? And then if it's really good, if it's a deep article, book, video, or whatever, I listen to it and I put my notes in as I'm listening. So what I learn is connected under the node for the video itself, and I keep going from there. And that act then makes my memory very visual because the brain has that particular layout. And so now I see and refresh here. And then later when I'm browsing, anytime I trip across that particular thing again, it refreshes these neurons. So I'm like, oh, right, right, right. I, re I remember that thing. So it's good because I then run across things later, which I normally wouldn't do with handwritten notes because I wouldn't go back through handwritten notebooks. All of that said, I have great appreciation for what you just shared with us because uh, like sometimes taking copious notes tunes you out of the actual process of synthesizing. Right. So, so, so I find that my use of the brain forces me to synthesize more, which I love. I think it's, I think it's great, but I, I think that's unusual. I think most people's experience of digital notography it isn't necessarily paying off. Anybody else with, with thoughts? Uh, Clark, well, jump in. It, it, it reminds me um, of the uh, discussions about the importance of reflection. And you know what a topic uh, reflection is for me. Um, so for those of you who don't know me as much, I've spent 30 years building computer systems that we call reflective architectures, and now in Europe is called self-awareness. So these are systems that can reason about themselves. But the point that I want to go back to is that there's a lot of studies on education and that people don't really absorb anything unless they reflect on it or unless you get the student to reflect on what their experience and their understanding is. And Robert, I've had the same experience where things can, can come out glibly because I'm fast and I'm quick on my feet. Mm -hmm. And I've really learned to slow that process down and, and not do that. And then I, I, I haven't heard it called system two thinking, by the way. Uh, system two, I'm borrowing from Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman, where he talks okay. about system one and system two thinking. This is just a for briefing for anybody who's not heard of it, and I can go to it in my brain, but I won't because I, I like where we are here. Um, and system one is your instinctual response. And, and system one is wrong a lot, really a lot. 
but we humans are kind of lazy about responses and we want to, you know, we get overwhelmed easily. We want to get things out of the way, <clears throat> out of the way. So we, we fall back on system one all the time. And also a lot of people's communications, let's just say advertisers and politicians don't really want us switching into system two thinking. Yeah. Right. So they're busy yeah. appealing only to system one. They, they don't want us to bump through that layer where we start engaging the gears of logic or whatever it is. And here, here I use the word logic very gingerly because I think part of this discussion is, is everything have to be logical? Sometimes does intuition matter as much as logic? We'll go there as well. well right? So I, I really want to uh, go off on your remark about the uh, breaking through because one of the things, um, you know, so I don't know if we already passed this in the conversation. Just tell me and give me a road sign. I doubt uh, it. Go ahead. But uh, I wanted to go into sort of uh, some of the reasons why I didn't respond to that conversation that was in our group uh, last week. It, it really shut me down. Um, and it didn't shut me down because of my spirituality or something like that. It actually shut me down because of my science. Um, and so I, I wanted to bring up two thoughts here. One of them was that breaking through that glib level doesn't mean that you throw away emotion. Emotion is not the enemy. It's not like you have to go through this emotional layer to get down to the truth, the core of, of how we reason and how we think. And I've written articles about how you have emotional reasoning and the role that it might have played in our evolution. Um, I was actually at some early workshops in Vienna with Rosalind Bacard and other people who have done a lot of work in emotional research. And there's a lot of very troubling things about that community, which is why I actually dropped out of it. Um, but the other part was that I felt like uh, one of the things that was going on in that conversation was really bad science. It really violated my notions about science. So one of the things I've tried to teach kids when I would teach at my son's school, uh, you know, sometimes I would give these lectures as a scientist. I come in and I talk about science. And I always start out with the sentence that science is not a collection of facts. That is not what science is. That's exactly what it isn't. Okay. Now, what makes that hard and goes back to your remark, and I don't know where you went, Jerry, but anyway, um, but one of the things that makes that hard is that uh, um, it has to do with that breaking down through those layers because as scientists, we can stay on a very glib level. You know, well, these are the facts, but actually part of science is always this process, always this process of reflection where you're constantly second guessing your own assumptions and your own attitude and your own bias. And you're, and you're trying to understand how that could have interfered with your observations and with your interpretations, because science is always a set of stories, always. Anyway, so that wasn't going to come out in any kind of helpful email in that conversation. Um, and I found myself really stuck because it was poor theology and poor science all together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this kind of gets at the line. Setting, they arise in families and churches and business and studies all over the place. So just identifying when something like that happens and reacting to it is, is really, really um, useful. And sorry, Kirsty, I disappeared because I was screen sharing some of the topics you were talking about, like Ross Picard and a couple other things, oh, okay. which I will do now and then on these Inside Jerry's Brain calls at, okay. the, risk, at the risk of derailing the conversation, because sometimes really it, it pays to just stay with the words. Um, but I'm trying to figure out, <clears throat> and, and, and I can use anybody's help on this. Um, I'm trying to figure out how context makes, uh, can improve the conversation um, at the danger of distracting it, but but can we can we feed off this shared context and can we feed and improve the shared context? So as we talk, when somebody says something I don't know, I'll go look it up and add it to my brain. Uh, sometimes it'll take enough work that I'll do it after the calls, but I will, you know, if, if I have an open tab, tab in my browser, that'll, that means I, I, it's worth remembering I'm going to go find it and, you know, put it in my brain right. at some point. Okay. Um, but I want, I want to be 
collaborating that way as well as we talk. So that, that's where I went. Or you could uh, just write it down in your notebook. <laughs> I could just hand write it in my notebook. And, and I'm an old school square ruled paper guy. Like I, I, haven't, I haven't touched a pencil in a long time, but I'm like a, a pen and square ruled paper guy on notepads. I still do that. Mm -hmm. but, but I confess that I do it less and less. I, I, I've been in Evernote, which is okay for this, not fabulous, but not bad. And so I've been trying to be consistent about keeping notes in Evernote because then I can find them, carry them. They're available on every device. I don't have to scan a piece of paper later. <clears throat> and that scanned piece of paper isn't searchable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanted to pass the, the floor to, to Clark, who had a point about sort of note taking. Well, I, I, I jumped in late and I don't want to derail the conversation, but you were talking, uh, Jerry, about the processing value of putting it in your uh, mind map and the conscious reflection you were doing. And I'd known about mind mapping and I hadn't done it. I made a point when I took notes, even though I never reread them, to actually paraphrase what people said instead of taking them verbatim. And in doing that, even if you never look at the notes again, you're getting value from the extra processing as you, as you think. I had this problem when I was listening to keynotes that they'd say something interesting, my mind will go off. And by the time I came back, I lost the plot. <laughs> um, so I started mind mapping as a way for me to keep enough extra cognitive load to, um, to follow what they were saying. And yet the mind mapping and trying to extract the underlying structure um, was really valuable to me. As an interesting side note, I actually, started posting them on my blog just because I, there I'd created something, let's think out loud, post it to my blog. They become some, became some of my most popular posts. Um, and the odd thing is, I don't think they're of value to anybody but those who heard the keynote as well, because it's hmm. really hard to sort of follow it. It's, it's little bits and pieces. There's some structure that may help it. Uh, as an interesting side note, that gets much harder when you have people who tend to sort of throw out random bits and jump back and forth instead of a well-structured talk. But I, I think it gets back to, you know, Kirsty was mentioning that the science is a bunch of stories and if there is a good narrative that helps make it, narratives are both dangerous and valuable. They can help lead us to sensible places, but they can also uh, be used to uh, misconstrue and miscontextualize things, which I think is something that we're seeing a lot today. Absolutely. I think that narratives are both, I think, the most convincing thing for humans. Like we love stories, we love narrative, and also in some cases the most dangerous thing because flawed narratives can take a whole bunch of people down the wrong, down the wrong path. Judy, off to you. Well, I wanted to comment on Christie's analysis or her observations about science because I find this, I am a scientist among other many things, but a big piece of that is I think the ability to take in data and then sort the data and, and examine it in light of existing knowledge from a scientific context, but from a bigger context as well. And so to go back to the first comments about note taking, I find that I, I start out already simplifying the content I'm trying to track by taking notes on the things that are not verbatim everything, but are sort of my summary with sort of shorthand notes about where I want to go with that summary or resources to go back to. And that process of examination is what I consider the root of science in terms of, of how we collect sort, prioritize, and store for retrieval in our brain, in our head, or in other mechanisms, um, the content that we want. And it's kind of not useful to me unless I have an opportunity to re-examine it at some point. And if I don't mm. re-examine it, I probably won't retain it very well. Um, one of the reasons I love squirrel paper and that I kind of miss squirrel paper is that I created my own little format where my notes about what was happening were up, up on the left going down. <clears throat> my notes about what to ask or what to add to the conversation or, or what, what to ask were basically at the bottom coming up. And then <clears throat> my notes about what to contribute to the conversation were down the right margin. <clears throat> and that's just, that just how it ended up happening. I, I'd keep track of what was up in the middle, but then, then, I, I, then what that let me do was not have to blurt out and jump in all the time about this thing before I lost it in my head that was so valuable to the conversation, but rather 
wait until the end and say, hey, if you're interested, we didn't get to these things, but boom, 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 boom. <clears throat> and I had them listed and, and I would just write down enough trigger word that it, that it would take me down the same conversational thread. Now, one, one of the things I regret not forming as a habit in my life is checking your notes later. I don't reread my notes that much. I don't go back to my own stuff because Judy, what you just said about just, and also Kirsty, like, like reflection, reprocessing, going back and seeing what you thought for a second is super helpful. Well, I find that what I, I don't really review the notes per se. That was a technique I was taught as an undergraduate in terms of long-term storage of memory, that if you took the notes, you had high recall right after you took them. But if you didn't refresh them or re-examine them within 24 hours, you, the slope down was steep. And the more you re-examined it, the more likely it would all make it to long-term memory. But I think that the, the piece that's that kind of connects with the, the line between kook and science or this vague difference between reality and non-reality is what I kind of call critical thinking. But it's the examination of each piece of information you confront to your accumulated judgment and your other sources of judgment. And then there are things you take on faith or because there's some intuitional element of it that rings true to you that hasn't yet been proven, but isn't categorically proven to be impossible from a scientific side. So that would be my definition of that kook line, is that if it's been proven to be impossible, <laughs> that's data that I have to take in. I may still have faith beyond that proven impossibility, but that's a different zone. Yeah, it is a different zone, right? And, but that's oh. a different zone. Well, it's a little bit like cold fusion or something like that, right? It's like right. non-replicable experiments, some claim is made, where, where are we in that territory? Um, then I didn't have too much trouble rejecting. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but, I guess, but when we start to talk about things that, are, that move into the zone of spiritual or collective consciousness or, or accumulated wisdom of people or intuition, that's a lot harder line to draw hard boxes around. Um, Kirsty, and then I want to go to Jean, who raised his hand. Go ahead, Kirsty. Um, well, I'll make it quick because I don't because I haven't heard Jean speak before. Okay, so um, I just want to say something that another part of this thing about what I try to teach about science when I have had occasions to lecture on it. Um, so, you know, you guys know that I'm also a mathematician also. And one of the problems about that, and, and so here gets into an area, and it's, it's really at heart in our scientific education. Um, we clumsily throw out the notions of what we mean by proving something in science. So, Judy, you were saying exactly correct things. You know, you take this body of evidence and... And uh, this goes back to having a good story. There's a, there's a helpful, a helpful story. And we retain those helpful stories for as long as they're helpful. Okay. And some of them have been 2000 years of helpfulness, like gravity. Okay. They, it just keeps enduringly being helpful, even though we don't know a lot of things about it. But that's really different from the notions of mathematical proof. Okay. And we actually don't prove things in science. I hate to say this. We do not. We prove things in mathematics because we have a well-defined formal space uh, with which, within which we can actually use proof methods. But in science, it's all this a matter of aggregating this useful evidence for this useful story. And that's what it is. And that's different from proof. So when I talk about bad science and bad theology, I, I really hate some of this discussion that I hear going on by prominent scientists who have become fundamentalists in their own right, because they're sitting there saying things, there is no God, there is no, no other, there is nothing else in the universe, you know, this kind of logical positivism. And that's a misuse of science. Forget the theology for a moment, it's a misuse of science. Mm -hmm. um, let me go to Gene. And Heard you say that you were taking notes in Evernote, and I was just curious why you were taking your notes in Evernote rather than in the brain. Um, it's a great question, partly because I try not to use the brain for evanescent things. So I don't do my calendar in the brain. 
I don't do what's next, what I'm doing next week. I don't do my to-do list. I don't do. Uh oh. Treat the brain as the long-term permanent archive. Oh shoot! Tell me when you, you can want, hear me. You, again. Want, you want to back up a bit? You you hung. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. My neck connection is not that happy right now. Okay. Um, so I treat the brain as the long-term archive of the stuff I really want to keep and, and share with other people because mm. I have two audiences in mind always when I put something in the brain, me, and I know that I publish it, so anyone else who happens to stumble across it. So whatever I put in it needs to be clear enough that somebody might be able to infer what I intended by putting something in the brain. Um, mm -hmm. But... I don't take notes for meetings in the brain. I don't, you know, I sort of, I, I, I really don't use it. For, I try not to use it for transient things. I try to mm -hmm. use it for things, things worth remembering for the long term. So all my transient notes go into Evernote, <clears throat> and that's a problem because Evernote doesn't really generate permalinks I can put into um, the brain in a nice way so that if I did want to link, link my notes, I, you know, I'll, I'll keep links to documents. That's fine. I just don't want to mm -hmm. pour all the documents into the brain file. I, I'm very <laughs> conscious of indexes that are too large, you know, things get bulky, they break down. That's just an old, you know, it's, it's like people who were wondering why we should waste a megapixel of memory, you know, a megabyte of memory on a megapixel of pixels. Nobody's going to need that. Why don't we just keep the command line, right? There's a vestigial part of me that's probably behaving that way. Um, but that's partly why. Okay. And I wish that the notes field in the brain could in fact be an Evernote note. Like that would make my life really easy. If I could couple the brain to Evernote in a way that notes were just shared, you know, Evernote notes, that would be fabulous. But it's not open, doesn't play that way. Are, are you sure? Have, have you tried it with version 10? I've not tried it. I didn't know it was even on his, on Harlan's well, list of things to maybe ever try to do. No, what they, what they did with version 10 is that in the, in the right-hand panel where the notes are, you, it's, it can actually be a web browser. So that, so that any, right. in other words, where you would have links that you would go to, the links actually show up on the right-hand side so that your email and, and any other websites or anything you go to, you don't go there. It brings it to you in, in version 10. Oh, right. But I've never wanted to use the browser inside the brain, but I'm, I'm thinking about it very differently from what you're saying right now. And okay. uh, do you mean down here? I don't know where you mean. Like if I ask right. something, I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, why don't you share? Why don't let me stop sharing and you share uh, share with us and, and show for it. We'll get a <clears throat> a tutorial. Uh, let me uh, go change this option because I turned it off. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's annoying. Yep. It's embed embed browser for web links. So what it normally does when I, when I had that on is it goes to every page you land on. It basically goes and searches for whatever you just clicked on. Right. So if you, if you, went, to my, if you went to my thought in, in your brain and it was a LinkedIn page, it would launch your browser to LinkedIn. But that's right. always been there. Yeah, that's always been possible. Oh, it has? <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is, okay. This is, this is a, a time-honored feature that I always turn off because I don't want to be looking at the... At, the, at each thing that I, that I browse through, because I browse through a lot of stuff every day in the brain. Okay. I, I have to admit that I have had a 20-year love-hate relationship with the brain. Mm -hmm. It is the piece of software that has been installed and uninstalled from my system at least twice a year for 20 years. Oh, wow. That's really and, interesting. And the current incarnation is only a month old. That's but, so at, but at the moment, I'm really hooked. So okay. we'll, we'll see how long it lasts this time. That's very interesting. And in 21 years, I've never uninstalled it. I've, I can tell. I mean, that's I've, obvious. I've, I've, had a couple, I've had a couple periods where the brain was sort of broken, and there was a month where I couldn't add anything, so I had to keep notes you know, somewhere else in a text doc or Evernote, uh, and then I could go back to it. But I've never actually uninstalled it. I've, I've, but I'm also, it's love-hate, because I, I'm extremely frustrated that it's not open, that there's no API. There's a bunch of things we could go, go into that way. Um, I wanted to take something that Clark put in the chat earlier as an opportunity for, for, to talk through an example of <clears throat> like the, the line, right? Um, and the, the topic is uh, learning styles. And um, before we dive into it, 
I just would, li would like everybody uh, do, this means I agree, this means I disagree. Can you put your hands in a gesture? This means I'm meh. Can you <laughs> put your hands in a gesture when, when I say learning styles, do you agree that they exist and matter? Do you think, feel strongly that they're a stupid idea or are you like, who's talking about learning styles? So everybody put your hands up where you are. Wait, 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 wait. you have to define learning styles. There's different. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna let you all define learning styles any way you want to. Okay. So, meh, negative, up, up, down, up, mixed, mixed, mixed. Okay, fabulous, thank you. Now we can define learning styles and go into it because I think that part of our disagreement is about our definition of learning styles, for starters, um, and, I, and I, I think we may be seeing it differently. Um, and Clark, would you rather jump in first or would you rather I jump in first? If you don't mind, uh, I've been looking at this a long time. Now, the, the, it's one of those things that feels right. We were talking about that a while ago. Yeah. And that it, we know learners differ. Anybody who's ever taught recognizes there's the differences between learners. And the appeal of learning styles is that we can reliably characterize them. And that if we can, we should use that to their advantage. And this make, would seem perfectly sensible. However, there's a couple flaws in this. So uh, Hal Pasher led a blue ribbon panel for the American Psychological Society, Science and the Public Interest. They did a study. And I happen to know how he was a professor of mine. I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I have great faith in him. And at the end of the day, they were looking at, does it make any sense to try and adapt to learners' learning styles? And they found the evidence was no. They found some studies, that said yes, but more studies that said no, it was a meta-analysis. And the interesting, to me, what's, you know, we also have better advice. We have advice that says, don't try and adapt the learning to the learner, adapt the learning to the learning outcome. But you go further back and say, okay, but maybe we still be, are able to characterize learners. And Caulfield et al. led a blue ribbon panel in the UK looking at should learning styles be used in, in K-12 education. And they looked at all the instruments and they found like 72. And they picked 13 representative ones that included MBTI, by the way. And they did a psychometric validity analysis. And there's a number of things you need to have psychometric validity. It has to measure what you think it measures, has to be independent variables, has to be reliable testing over time. And only one met all four psychometric validity standards. And it was relatively interesting and it was one dimension. And the rest didn't. And the point is, it would seem nice to try and characterize learners, but we can't. They change depending on context, what you're learning, phase of the moon, <laughs> whatever it is. And so while we know learners differ, we haven't been able to reliably characterize it with any instrument. And it may not be a good thing to do anyways. It may be a form of, you know, a small age of a small instance of discrimination. Instead of looking at them as learners on their behavior, we're trying to to characterizing a lot of it is self-report anyways, which is problematic as well. So that's, you know, sort of a thumbnail sketch of learning styles, why it appeals, why it doesn't work. At least, you know, and this is science, as Kurti was pointing out, it hasn't worked yet. Uh, we haven't find a, found a reliable instrument, which isn't to say we won't eventually and find a way to do it, but we haven't yet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. So you, I'm showing you the thought critiques of learning styles because I do, um, I have a lot of thoughts under critiques, critiques of, of like pretty much everything. <clears throat> so I'm, I've been trying to collect up and you mentioned some research earlier that I'd love to add here later. If you don't mind sending me a couple links, that'd be great. Um, and I think our difference might be, my, my hunch on our differences is that when I say learning styles, I mean learning, and I'm a big fan of unschooling. I'm a fan of John Taylor Gatto. I hate the compulsory school system. And I, all the critiques of learning styles to me are basically, this is impossible to implement in the school system. A, we can't have teachers modify their curriculum or their teaching methods for every student. That's just impossible because they're overworked and underpaid and already have too many kids. B, we could be tagging a kid for life with a label that could be discrimination. C, I mean, I can go through a series of ways in which, of course, it's impossible to implement in the school system because the school system, to me, is congenitally broken. I'm really interested in, um, so I had a thought, I think I put it in my brain at some point. Um, if you remember the sorting hat from uh, Harry Potter, <clears throat> 
So I didn't put it in here. That's very interesting. Uh, so one of my long-term, on my long-term wish list, um, this might have been in one of those little breakdowns where there was a month where I couldn't put anything in the brain, but I thought I did. So it's in this version of the brain, but not in the actual brain. Um, what I'm really interested in, and, and I, I think this would be useful, some experience, some test, some thing you could go through that would tell you you're probably better adapted to learn with these kinds of ways and look for those ways. But also in this advice, know that there's, there's these ways in which you perceive yourself where you seem to not be very strong. Here's ways in which you could strengthen those. If you felt like it, you can balance yourself out, whatever. What, I don't mean that now I only learn things through musical analogy. I think that's a, that's a dumb approach to life, right? But I think that if I learn mathematics best through musical, musical analogy, or as some mathematicians reported, through visualizing gears in their head, or water pouring through a system, or whatever, that's a great insight that should lead people to learn better. And I wish that all learning resources available openly on the net were tagged up by these learning styles with simple tags, like um, mechanical cogs and gears or something like that so that anybody looking for something to learn with could sort through them and go, oh, 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 I think I'll try these first because they seem to be fitting my learning style. So I think I'm looking at it completely outside the school system because I know that in the schools, within the school system, it's being barfed up, coughed up, tissue rejection, there are white blood cells all over it. Um, I kind of get that. Does that sort out my position at all, Clark, or no? I understand your position, but I'm, I, I'm questioning, you know, the basis of the premise. Do you have evidence that these sorts of approaches, even individually, would make a difference? I do believe that, you know, taking on certain types of behaviors or things like um, persistence and learning and a belief that, you, you know, you can, you know, it's about your effort, not just about your innate ability. Uh, you know, growth mindset type of stuff. And some of this is controversial, but I agree. But, and I certainly think, you know, we should have a variety of metaphors and find a good entry point. And maybe we can correlate certain entry points to certain individual characteristics. So if you have a number of different ways to think about math, cogs and gears or water flow, maybe we can find that that's a better entry point. But eventually you want people to see all of these because then there's a better chance that when a problem matches to one element of it, it'll activate a, a suite of different ways of thinking about it because they're related and then you have a better chance of finding one that maps to a solution space. So I'm, you know, I don't mind different entry points and exploring that and eventually finding it, but do you, you know, you seem to be in, in uh, proposing that there is a known basis for doing this now and I'm just, I'm not aware of one and I welcome hearing of it. And I'm not basing my, you know, uh, strong opinions weekly held on learning styles on scientific studies. I'm basing it on instinct that I know that my approach to things is really different from other people's. They take a, they have a completely different mental model that they're using to connect things in, into the bigger picture or whatever it is. And not that there's, and not that everybody has one consistent mental model, anything like that, <clears throat> but I've seen and read of people taking completely different approaches. And I think that's really useful. And the moment learning styles gets demonized and cast out, which is what's been happening, we lose, we lose the ability to use that as a learning lever, as a, as a, as a you know, good tool for learning more effectively for whoever. So, so that's kind of where I go. And I'd, I'd love to make room for Kirsty and um, Marie as well, who I know probably has a lot to say about this. So go ahead, Two quick points to add to the discussion. Clark, I really appreciated your summary. That was just excellent. And I, can you send those uh, articles through the usual mail so I don't have to kind of grab them off my screen? And uh, I, will take the, I, will, I will take the chat and I will send everybody a link to the recording Perfect. of this call and it'll include the chat. So Clark, if you put anything Great. here, I'll, I'll add it, et cetera. Go ahead, Kirsten. Um, but I want to go back to two things that I think were really important in this discussion. Uh, one was the notion of preferences. Okay, so preferences come from the inside out. And so you can have preferences, Jerry, in, in how you enjoy learning or how you want to look at the material. Um, and that's really different from being 
observed by somebody else and told you're a visual type or you're a whatever mental X type or, you know, whatever the characterization is. That's one part. I think of it, I can't help but go back to mathematics and other areas I know and love um, and think about how it is when I'm tutoring somebody, there are lots of individual differences and you, and you teach them that they have a repertoire of strategies. So I think one of the important parts of this notion of learning styles would actually be empowering the learners to understand that there could be a tremendous number of ways that they have accessible to them to learn, okay? And that that's maybe the power of it. And then the third part was that you guys, nobody's using any physical analogies. I found that very interesting, okay? Because now I want you to think about somebody who's coaching uh, some young woman to hit her first ball at baseball, okay? And if you've ever been in that situation, which I've been, uh, um, both receiving and coaching, um, that's a wonderful example where you use a whole bunch of different strategies. So you might say, look, stand like me. No, here, hold your bat a little bit this way. No, try to think of the ball as whatever kind of object. In other words, you give them a whole bunch of strategies And I think that fits in with what Clark was saying. And somehow if we keep this physical analogies in mind too, we might think more healthily about these uh, mental ones. Um, Marie, you want to jump in? Yeah. So I think when we say learning styles, what we really mean is teaching styles. This is a mechanism that I'm supposed to be using to put something into the child's brain. And I think that's backwards and wrong. I think the way we want to think about it is creating an environment in which different ways that people learn, which may be infinite, are all going to be supported and, uh, and, and made possible. I have been doing a lot of work recently on student agency, and I have come up with a definition that student agents, a very narrow definition for K-12, where we say that student agency is when students of their own volition will... Uh, improve their learning, their learning environment, or themselves in some way. Uh, But we break that down into the will and skill, where will is uh, motivation, and that's based on uh, self-determination theory, about 20 years of uh, research, that talks about how uh, intrinsic motivation is Uh, fostered and that it's through autonomy, mastery, and relatedness. And I'm sure you've all seen Dan Pink's book and all all the stuff that has to do with that. But it also talks about metacognition, which has two pieces. It's got a piece that is uh, knowledge of cognition, which is understanding how people learn and how you yourself learn. And the second one is uh, being able to uh, have actions in cognition. So things like planning and monitoring your performance and reflecting on your performance. And I think that if we look at these fundamental building blocks, all five that I just met or seven that I just mentioned, that having an environment that puts those things in place that recognizes the infinite <clears throat> numbers of unique outcomes that can, that can come from those from students and that <clears throat> reinforces all the different ways that people naturally Will, will tend to learn along with what Kirsty said, which is to offer uh, very concrete, uh, specific strategies that may work or may sort form as a basis for them to develop their own strategies, that that's an environment in which you can have lots, support lots of different ways of learning, as opposed to trying to reduce yourself to some finite number of ways of teaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that when you, as soon as you put the teaching word in here, it really, it lights up, right? It's like, oh, right, we're, we're sort of, a, we're approaching. <clears throat> and uh, if you focus on the learner and make it a learner kind of thing, it might actually work. I think Clark is pointing out how dysfunctionally this topic has been dealt with and implemented in different ways and that it's causing a, a ton of problems for people in the system. And I, I agree with all that. And, um, but I, I'm trying to figure out how to not let that destroy this very powerful idea of letting people explore how to learn in really different ways, um, letting, letting them approach things. And so I, I, I've got here a thought, types of learning, which is different from types of education. So um, I've got here 
sex education, executive education, neuroeducation, paideia, place-based education, vocational school, et cetera. Um, uh, but just types of learning, blended learning, connective learning, continuous learning, covenantal learning. I don't remember putting that in. Um, that is from a book. Uh, it comes out of Talmudic commentaries, Josh Plaskoff, another state of mind, perspectives from the wisdom traditions uh, on management and business. That's interesting. Anyway, back to, uh, back to us in the booth here. So I have something to say about the uh, original topic and the, uh, the, the, the chain of email that we went into. It is <clears throat> something that pushed a lot of buttons for me because I am definitely a science firster. Um, nothing I can do about it. That's, that, that's how, my, how, how my brain is, is, is wired. And it caught me at a time when I have been particularly hot buttoned about the ideas of people not thinking well. And the way that has been coming out in my, in my uh, not, I'm not so proud of moments is I keep saying, well, no wonder people think it's okay to rip babies away from their mother because 70% of the people in the United States have an imaginary friend called God. And I can see how that would go. Right. I mean, yeah. it's like this is a purely emotional <clears throat> system one <laughs> kind of a thing that has been coming up. And I've been trying to think through why am I feeling this way? Why am I saying these things? Why, <laughs> why is this even who I am right now? Um, and I think what a lot of it has to do with is the frustration that I see in the fake news and the poor media where people will use the trappings of science and logic, but what they're actually doing is putting out fallacies and non-factual and some, in fact, some information that is so bad, you can't even call it non-factual. It's not wrong. It's not, I mean, it's not that it's not right. It's not even wrong. It's just, you can't say that. <laughs> you absolutely can't say that. And so, um, I've been doing, I actually have been doing a lot of thinking about, I believe there's a lot of value in religion, but I believe that all that value comes from stuff that science does not yet know how to address. And therefore we don't test religion. We don't test the existence of God. Anything that is not testable is not science. Right? Science is all about testing things that we believe. And if you can't test it, it's not science. And if you can't prove or disprove it, it's not a fact. And if you think it's okay to rip babies away from their mothers, <laughs> then you probably have an imaginary friend. Um, and Marie, you've also taken us into the nice deep end of this conversation, um, kind of right on schedule, uh, around what happens when there's people with really bad intent surrounding all of this difficult stuff, planting stories that are completely atrociously false, et cetera, et cetera, where we don't have reliable attribution mechanisms, where fact-checking is hard and overwhelmed and actually doesn't, prove, doesn't help when you present it to these people, et cetera, et cetera. But Kirsty was, was raising her hand about uh, some of the questions on scientific method. Do you want to jump in? You're muted right now. There. So, um... First of all, I honor the emotion that I heard in your voice. And these topics are crazily painful uh, to everybody who cares about science and everybody who cares about different notions of spirituality. Um, there, there's, uh, and I think that uh, there are malicious people, as Jerry has said, who are purposely playing on that. Um, I guess personally one of my feelings is that as I said bad theology and bad science and uh, you know we could go into a whole discussion uh, about this thing that's being considered the enemy right now of religion but the other day at, at, at Thanksgiving I was at a thing I was actually singing at a 700 person interdenominational faith event here in Thousand Oaks. Cause I don't know if you remember that in addition to the horrific fires we had, we had 14 kids killed, shot down. And um, the interfaith 
community here actually includes Muslims and Baha'i and Buddhists and uh, you name it. It was there talking about uh, people sort of clumsily reaching across different denominational lines and places where some of them would pre think that some of the other belief systems were pretty wacky. But there was an undercurrent of feeling like there's other in the universe and that that concept of other, of love surpassing all, could actually unite, unite people. And so from the point of view of the billions of people who actually believe in other on the planet, um, they look towards religious beliefs as being actually something that can bring people together, that could actually heal wounds. Um, and you certainly see a lot of beautiful activity. And one of the hard parts is that we're seeing sort of the ugliest of the ugliest. So to sit there and say that um, this characterizes religious belief in the United States is a little bit like saying Nazism uh, describes all political belief. Just because some crazy wackos have a system of belief that takes and perverts those institutions really does not mean you know, as you said, you know, it's like, why am I saying these things? And, and, and that, I think, is something that I really actually would love the reflection on the group to realize is to actually go to the heart of the question that you said, which is, why am I saying this? And to realize how human we are. And when we get pushed on enough, we get polarized, too. And that's how it happens. Okay, so people of, of good heart and good intention and good belief if they get pushed on enough, they, they start to get angry and they start to get eno emotional and they start to hit back. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that plays in to exactly what I consider some of the evil forces that are at play right now, because they know that like Osama bin Laden really was very successful in his campaign against Saudi Arabia and some of the Middle Eastern countries that he was really targeting, but also against the Western powers. You know, he managed to tie in a whole bunch of people into a whole process of hate. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, the part where I felt the most discouraged in the conversation a week ago was because I actually considered Jerry's List one of my safe places. And suddenly we're, we were making it really unsafe for people to sit there and say, and now this is a non, this is a spiritual non-denominational statement, that to me that there are things in the universe that are beyond, beyond material values or be beyond immediate self-centered gains, you know, and that those things matter to me. And that's what I heard this uh, person reaching out and saying, okay, I'm going to take some of my spiritual beliefs and I'm going to do something because we have a colleague who's sick and hurting right now. Okay. So, I don't know if you saw my responses on that list, but I absolutely agree with that. And I believe in the beauty in religion. And I believe that what happens in most religions for most people, most of the time, and especially with the mature philosophers, is that you are finding that sort of uh, something that brings people together, that helps us evolve, that makes us more mature spiritually and, and, and emotionally. And I use the word metaphor a lot. And the reason I use the word metaphor is because I think that those things are not things that we understand yet through science and logic, but there is a part of us that still has that as an important and real and valid form of knowing. And so most of the time when people talk about God, it's a metaphor for something that's real, but I don't believe it's somebody who sits on a cloud and doles out gifts and punishments, right? And you know, well, you know, you're, and I'm not actually going to preclude that, but it's probably not on a cloud, but, or at least not the clouds we're inventing right now. Ha ha. Anyway, um, the, the thing about it is that, um, I want to go back to the other part, which I really care about, which is the science. I consider myself, you know, a scientist now for all my life. I mean, that's what I've done. And um, a lot of significant work, 50 years, 
of science, actually. Um, I really care about it. And that was actually another part of the conversation that was really uh, bothering me. So I have had deep conversations with certain colleagues. In general, I don't talk about God and science much. Okay, but once in a while I've talked about it with various colleagues, especially in Europe, which is full of interesting philosophical ideas and thinking and things that they will consider. Um, and um, what I don't want to see is people not reflecting on their needs to have a sense of perspective and values that reaches beyond certain kind of materials or positivistic views of life. And when they do that, they sometimes turn their science into a religious view. And that leads into very poor theology because they're not thinking it through. They're not reflecting on the fact that they've started to elevate this into a religion. And to me, what I've said very bluntly is that one of the reasons I like being a religious spiritual person is it keeps my science cleaner it actually helps my science because i'm not loading my science with my religious and spiritual needs mm, interesting for understanding what the meaning of life is and what my perspective is right. does that do you, do you kind of understand that am i saying that clearly absolutely very much so personally i draw from buddhism and I, Buddhism is where I get my philosophical and uh, where I get my metaphors, if you will. You know, life is suffering. That means a lot of different things. And I'm able to use that in a lot of different ways. And, but I also recognize very clearly that when I think about that, it is not the same thing as when I think about uh, how fast is an object falling and when does... Um, uh, That's right terminal velocity kick in and so forth. And so the place where I get frustrated is when you use scientific language to try to justify religion, right? Oh no, well, what if God invented the world 5,000 years ago with fossils, right? Okay, that makes me crazy. Using a 3D printer <laughs> that we have yet to discover, but it's buried under there in one of the layers. Actually, it's, it's going to be discovered than time travel. But yeah. And no, the, the aliens brought the uh, 3D printers. And handed it to the lizard people. Right, exactly. Right? No, no. I and mean, I put all that into the same kind of category of thinking. But it also makes me crazy when people use religious language, religious thinking, and try to apply it to science. Which is I agree. Mm. I agree. Right? So, so and, but here's but there are a lot of things that are real that are, I cannot discuss scientifically, but that have meaning and value and that I need to communicate with people. And I must use religious language to do it because it's the only metaphor available to me, such as grace. Mm -hmm. right? I can't talk scientifically about grace. Mm -hmm. okay. but, it's thing, but it's a thing and it's real. So we have 20 minutes left. Fortunately, okay. I'm sitting here with the Dalai Lama. So I have... <laughs> I have direct access, not as direct as Sky used to have, um, but still, he was the CTO for the Dalai Lama organization, I, I guess, for years, right? Um, and what I'd love to do is, is make room <clears throat> for the people who haven't had a chance in the conversation yeah. yet. So yeah. uh, let's, let's go quiet and Sky, Robert, Bo, Rich, uh, Rich is away from his desk, Michael, Douglas, uh, Doug, uh, if you want to jump in um, and share what this has brought up for you, I'd, I'd love that. And meanwhile, we can just sit with our thoughts for a moment because when the conversation moves quickly, it's hard to follow sometimes. Michael just posted a lovely thing to our chat and Doug, the floor is yours. Yeah, we I guess uh, where I go to is the word religion coming from Ray Leggeri to retie. Religion is a way of tying things together, but so is science. And what's striking is they're trying to tie together basically different things. And to me, the lesson is that science has been in the service of power, military and empire uh, since the beginning. And as a result, it has a skewed sense of what it's trying to understand. Uh, I want back to the learning style question, which is implicit in this. 
is that it's not just the person in relation to the thing to be learned, but it's the environment in which the learning is taking place. So the learning demands on a native living in the Brazilian jungle is really different than a native living in Paris. Uh, what they have to learn, how they're going to go about doing it. And it seems to me that can, including the environment uh, tells us a lot about what the learning needs to be about. And, and I think my, my objection is to learning styles within the school with a capital S environment, and that sort of pollutes the idea. And um, I don't want to revive that conversation because I think that it was a really interesting idea for me to turn to meta learning as a, as a different container for what I'm thinking about. Other folks who haven't uh, chimed in very much. Uh, Michael, do you want to talk about what you just posted? Sort of. Apologies for the cutting it and pasting it and also the messy places. It's, it's um, the head gets in the way so easily. I, I, I originally trained in physics and engineering, but then became quite entranced with the idea of irrational science. That is um, laws of form, George Spencer Brown, um, the sort of the quantum of fact. You know, is something what you think it is or isn't it? And how can you leave room for that uh, flexibility? Um, so most of my comfort in the learning world is about see what shows up rather than the, um, the specificity of a science. I remember one analogy that said you, you can't study astronomy in daylight. So if the parameters of your study are, it must be daylight between these hours, then stars do not exist. And um, that's always been my approach to what it is that I don't know. I, I just don't know what I don't know. Um, boy, can I get irrational very quickly. I'll leave it at that for the moment. I'm, I'm fascinated by this discussion. It's really turning my, my crank. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. And one of the things I wish for, maybe we do this on a different call, maybe it's too, you know, a bridge too far. <clears throat> I'd love to know what things are on the border for us, like what things we are, are, are completely kooky and what, what things are we know we believe in that are probably considered kooky by other people. I would, I would love to know that. Um, and we have a, a pretty good trusted space going here where we could sort of enumerate those perhaps. Um, but we'll let, let's see how to implement that. If, you, if, you, if you'd like to do that, let me know, and, and maybe we do another call where we go a little bit deeper having done that and just work on some of them and, and just discuss them. Because I, I found the discussion with Clark about um, uh, learning styles and, and other language and framing and all that quite useful. So I'm going to go back and kind of rearrange stuff on the deck of my little ship. Um, other folks who'd like to jump in? Sky? Yeah. Um, I was going to say I have nothing to say, but uh, in response to Michael's quote there, I will point out that during the day you can do radio, astron astro radio astronomy and um, also you can detect gravitational waves day or night. So changing, changing your perceptual mechanisms can lead to um, additional information and enlightenment. Well, yeah, of course. The tool set is what you use to discover what the tools will show you. Yeah, there's a whole other conversation on that too, right? Yeah. Using the tool set. Yeah, I mean, once the first non-optical telescope shows up, all things go all over the place, right? Like it cracks open whole new, whole new vistas. Yeah. So very interesting. Once it shows up, but it's got to show up first. And I'm also, I'm also, uh, this, this story may be apocryphal, but um, the notion that Galileo first used the telescope to show the papal armies, the armies across in the other valley, and look, you can get a close up and you can do a better count of how many enemy are coming towards you. It was basically a military instrument for, for seeing at a distance. Then he takes the same goddamn instrument and turns it up and shows them the moons of Saturn or whatever. And they're like, nope, nope, can't be happening. Not real, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the sa same instrument used in a different context, possibly at the same spot of ground, don't know. And I don't even know if the whole story is true, but, it, but, but that's the narrative I, I hold. Um, it's, it's 
quite interesting how whatever the belief system is that we are defending, whether it's to whatever degree that's conscious or deeply embedded, um, really matters. And if membership in society depends on your holding a belief system, you will squirrel around to any, you know, any, any lengths you want. There's a, a thought in my brain on Lysenkoism and basically the Soviet uh, re rejection of statistics and a lot of science, uh, which really screws up Soviet science for a long, long time. And certainly their ability to produce things and improve their production and whatever else. But, but the Soviets basically dismissed uh, a body of important work because it wasn't suiting the narrative of we're going to like make more stuff than those other people. It was proving that they were screwing that up, right? So we, we fool ourselves all the time, but then sometimes we build these really strong institutions uh, to fool ourselves and we reinforce it with punishment, with what have you, right? We, we, we have to reinforce a narrative and those are really dangerous because those can take generations to wash away. Um, yeah. There was an article in this morning's Times about a, a person, a journalist who went to Cambodia to, to interview people well after the killing fields and the genocide in Cambodia, and just of, of noticing how deeply the social trauma is embedded, where in most every village, almost every grown up has people who were disappeared or killed or tortured or committed the acts. Everybody's involved and it's all right there. Um, and it's like culturally wide. And what do you, you know, what do you do? The Chicago School of Economics, indeed, has driven many, many things that are not so good for us. Um, other thoughts as we um, get toward the, uh, the end of our time together. Where, uh, in particular, um, how might we inquire a little further into this topic? What would, would it be interesting to do a comparison with whoever shows up of what we believe to be true or not true? Um, certainly I will, I will share out a couple links into my brain of places. Um, in fact, let me actually do a little, a little sharing because um, I had set up for this call um, 1811 Kooks will bring me there. <clears throat> so this is uh, the call when I'm, uh, when I'm done posting the video to YouTube, I will add it to this particular thought in my brain. I'll pass that link around. Uh, but I had added, for example, contrarian ideas that I believe in, right? So I happen to believe that animals are more intelligent than we think. I've collected a whole bunch of articles about this, like a serious bunch of articles about this all over the place. Um, I believe that um, many famines are economic. They're not natural disasters. I mean, in, in many cases, people have died because they didn't have food, but almost every famine, when you look back through history, is, is economic and therefore also political. It's, it, these are not just natural disasters where people suddenly can't eat. Uh, the, Beng the Great Bengal Famine in India in 1943, there is plenty of rice for Indians to eat. The British will not release the rice and nobody has money to buy the rice. Millions of people starve. Um, so there's a bunch of contrarian, you know, uh, here's, a, here's a one that's uh, a little radical, and I just learned this in the last year. I read the book, The American Slave Coast, which is um, one of my now favorite history books. Uh, and one of the ideas in The American Slave Coast is that the actual motive of the American Revolutionary War was preserving slavery. It wasn't no taxation without representation, which was in fact a good cover story that neither the North nor the South could envision an American economy continuing without slavery. Um, Etna in Connecticut was insuring slaves. Uh, Rhode Island was the seat of shipbuilding for slave ships. New York was busy um, funding, financing cotton, you know, all of the slave trades, uh, everything. <coughs> Nobody could imagine America without slavery. So that's a contrarian idea, I believe. So none of these are pseudoscience. Some of these are history, right? I also happen to believe that schooling kills curiosity, that children are naturally curious. Maybe that's not contrarian. That probably shouldn't be there. Um, I'm a big fan of Alice Miller, and that leads me down to some c controversial child rearing practices, like co-sleeping, which somehow be became insanely controversial. You could roll over and kill your child. Seriously? How did that become a controversy? Um, so 
it's interesting to me to curate these and keep them together. And then what I'd like to have is as many conversations as anyone will tolerate to explore these fringe ideas and improve them because I'm happy to change my mind on things. I just need to figure out how and why and where. So um, here's another one. Many, many, early, <clears throat> many early cultures didn't spend much time sourcing food. Um, another one is one I posted recently, which is that um, there's a common narrative that we used to live only to like age 30 and now look, we live to like age 80 and that's just how it's always been. Well, it turns out that statistics, you know, infant mortality skews that and a whole bunch of other things skew those stats. It turns out that we used to live to old ripe, ripe old ages, just that not that many people survived to ripe old ages, but human longevity has probably been about the same for a long time. We are now messing with that with experiments on telomeres and, you know, whatever else, where we might actually artificially goose that. And that's actually really interesting. Yesterday I was watching a video about, you know, longevity and life expectancy. Um, I can probably uh, find it. It was, uh, da, 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 da. electric expectancy at birth. No, shoot, I'll have to find it when I'm not trying to like mind the time and uh, pay attention to Gene who raised his hand. Go ahead, Gene. I just was sort of wondering why this was such an interesting point of focus for you. The line between kooks and, and precogs? Yes. Um, because I, I, as I started the call, I feel like I'm trying to digest the universe and figure out how things work. And I think many people are like me in that way, um, are on that kind of quest. Like, why do we do things? Why are we in such a screwed up mess right now? Well, how do we do, how we do something to fix it? And a big piece of that is what we believe, um, because that dictates what we try to do to fix it or, or uh, what people do to try to tip it into chaos or why people even like chaos, right? Like, you know, investors, big money investors don't like a stable market. They like beta. They like volatility. They don't like stability. So they, every now and then, they will intentionally precipitate us into something like the 2008 global financial crisis, because if you're on the right side of that bet and the, everybody moves up and down a lot, you make a ton of money, for mm -hmm. example. So, so this quest between, you know, what, what's crazy and what's not, and some of the crazy ideas being weaponized, to me, if we crack some of this code and then if we can sort it out so that people can understand it and distribute it, we might help dampen the crazy nonlinear war that we're in. Does that make sense? Or they, and I'm really, really happy. Kirsty doesn't like that. Um, do you want to jump in and say why not? I, I, we can't hear you. There you go. Okay. Um, I think that um, there's been these studies now of really fringe beliefs. I mean, things that you guys, I mean, you know, um, I forget some of the kooky ones. They're so strange that they're even beyond their being aliens and things like that. There's now large groups. And so in some ways, I feel like you're trying to be too rational about, oh, okay, we'll look at the things that we think are on the fringe and we'll try to understand, uh, you know, that and maybe make those arguments better or something. That's, that's the feeling I'm getting from it, Jerry. Maybe that's not your intention at all. Whereas what I would think maybe would be a useful conversation first is to try to learn what we can about why people come to believe things and group pressures and things like, yeah, it's the conspiracy theories. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the crazy stuff. Well, um, I mean, and there's some that are not, that, that don't require beliefs in, in paranormal things. There's just things like QAnon. <clears throat> right, which is which is a crazy conspiracy theory that everything Trump and his people are doing is completely intentional. They are in total control, and they're leading us down a particular path. Yeah, and 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 I have a girlfriend that I've lost that I had since uh, we were five years old. Um, I've lost her to this uh, contrails, and she's actually on TV shows now talking about contrails. You know. And I tried to explain to her the physics of that. And she, she sent me NASA articles that supposedly was the reason why she could believe what she believed. And so I, I, I don't know. There's something about that that I think is the necessary conversation before we get into people's sort of individual gray areas. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of people's individual gray areas as a nice um, forum, format, arena, place to have some of these conversations, that's all. Um, not as, not as the, the best path forward to figuring this out. I'm, I'm listening with, with ears wide open to what the best, best paths might be to make use of this kind of uh, way of thinking or, or uh, way of going into the conversation. There's, there's something that we've lost in terms of the normalizing effects of the social groups around everybody. I mean, I mean, as a U.S. culture, we've somehow lost these sort of normalizing things that used to bring back the fringes that made people say, oh, come on, that's, that's really kind of ridiculous, you know? Um, and so the thing that used to be such a wonderful, helpful social glue among us of sort of mutual respect and okay you can believe that but we're going to have this mutual respect for each other has now been sort of uh uh really harmed by this uh lack of attention or something to these other mechanisms that used to bring people back together somehow and i'm saying it very mm. badly and i i could really use a sociologist in the group or an anthropologist in the group well, and also like yeah, and also history is really funny on this because, you know, in the 50s, discourse in the Senate might have been better, but black people in America were really screwed. And there was no sense of respect for them, That's no right. sense That's that their exactly opinion right. mattered. And the pill is 1961 and birth control and all of those, kind of, like, like it changes the status of women in society in, in ways that, you know, that nobody predicted and that, that like shook, th shook things up. And like there's, there's layer after layer of this because, um, you know, th there, there are different periods of time where we've been civil and now, like, like I'm reading a book called uh, Red State, Blue State, I think, um, by a super, super analyst. And he's writing about how did we get to this divided house and this divided country? How did, how did it come about? And I think the book is going to help me build more evidence that points to the Gingrich revolution. That basically when, when Gingrich comes into the speaker of the house in 1994, um, he basically lays down the new law. And this book is really good for early. So I have a thought in my brain, which is one of my beliefs. It's under my beliefs right here that Gingrich created the current political rift in America. Uh, here's the book I'm reading, The Red and the Blue, the 1990s and the birth of political tribalism. It really darkened my memory of Bill Clinton and his rise. Oh my God, I'd forgotten half the crap that Clinton pulled that, you know, he just barely made it to president and he had, you know, Trumpian style uh, stuff in his background anyway. Um, so, so Gingrich created this current political rift at the same time as we made great advances. Gay marriage was approved in this country. We made it through the Supreme Court. A whole bunch of other things happened, which brought other groups in, right? And, and partly we have this backlash when too many things advance here. There's a whole bunch of people that get really mad and they swing the pendulum way over to the other side. And it, it, at this case, I'm afraid the pendulum is really heavy and really it, like there's a lot of mass heading the wrong way um, right now because I have... Um, um, I have a thought basically where I'm tracking the global shift to the right and it's really frightening. I mean, what the, basically, uh, Gene, partly the reason I want to do this is that the weaponization of trust and tolerance and facts and the undermining of trust and facts and all those sort of things are very much central to the tactics and strategies of the people who are trying to shift us to authoritarian populism across the globe. And we need to stop that somehow. And I don't think anybody has decent countermeasures. I don't think anybody, I don't think that Democrat, I don't think um, liberals or journalists anywhere in the world have really figured out what the countermeasures are to these tools, <clears throat> to these tactics. So I'm, I'm pretty concerned that if we don't figure something out, we're going to be screwed. Too, too many of them think that the countermeasures are facts and they're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is that we tend to choose what we believe, sometimes consciously and sometimes subconsciously, and then we find things to support those beliefs, beliefs so that it creates a reinforcing structure 
that takes us in whatever direction that we were going. And the more that we go in that direction, the less likely we are to listen to anything contrary to that belief. Mm -hmm. um, what's the name for that fallacy? It's a... Uh... Somebody knows the name. Confirmation bias. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Motivated reasoning is the other name for it. So here's a bunch of stuff on confirmation bias. And as I do, uh, I put, oops, let's put this guy under here. Uh, so confirmation bias, a bunch of articles about it. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Absolutely agree. We and, and and my fear is that I love narratives. Um, I'm collecting all this evidence. I would love to have somebody confront me with the kinds of confirmation bias I'm engaged in. It would be interesting to me. Probably depressing, uh, but very interesting to me. So Jerry, I was actually just thinking about that. I was looking at your brain and saying, he, you have lots of things listed that are controversial, and, but there's nothing there that I would stand up and say, well, I don't believe that. And part of that reason is, is because I don't have enough information on it. And then I thought, well, in order to do that, I would have to go do the full research. And then I went, but wait. Jerry is probably fighting against confirmation bias with every single thing he puts in here. He's probably looking at more counter, counter examples than I would go look at. And therefore, I'm better off trusting this than trying to go and counter argument. And yes, and I'm, I'm trying really hard, but it's just me and the brain is not a great collaborative tool. In inside Jerry's brain, in this thing we're sitting in right now, which we should wrap, um, I'm trying to create a community of practice that does this together so that these things are buttressed better, explored better, and I'd love to explore them in the gentle sense of friendly inquiry that we've had here on the call, um, like a lot. And so any and all hints, suggestions, topic ideas, method ideas, uh, get yourself on the Inside Jerry's Brain uh, conversational Google group if you're not already, if you'd like to be part of this, because that's where I want to uh, have the ongoing conversation fed, you know, uh, with, with these as our punctuations. Um, if, you, if you go to insidejurysbrain.com, you'll see a little link that says, you know, get in the conversation. Um, but this is the goal. That, that's kind of why I'm, why I'm trying to do this exactly. So thank you, Marie. And, and we can never get enough information to feel completely sure, but we sure as hell can find the best thinking about these things and share it. And there's too much to go through individually um, so if we can synthesize the best of what we found and make those points to each other and then show where the arguments lie so that anybody can go pursue the different parts of it, I think that makes the collective inquiry much more powerful. So I think the next, the next step in my thinking there was the place where that gets interesting is because we have such a high caliber selected group of folks doing the discussion. Where this group disagrees is where the interesting territory lies. Very likely. Although is also likely a couple sigmas off where the public's disagreements are because we're not that representative. Um, so there's a danger in that we become enamored with the places where we differ and focus a lot on that and ignore the places where the bulk of America is just genuinely split and, and having a really hard time. And, and I'm interested in doing things as accessibly and comprehensively and broadly as possible. I'm interested in making, you know, things that are funny, things that are, uh, you know, <clears throat> games. I, if, if, we, if we created a card deck that helps people sit down and have difficult conversations, and I think there is a difficult conversations hard, card deck. Certainly there are a couple card decks for uh, have a, having a really interesting dinner party, like here are, here are great questions to put in front of people, but uh, they're not tuned toward today's predicament. Uh, but things like that might be super interesting. Any last words before I sign us off the call? Yeah, I was looking at Inside Jerry's Brain, and I'm not quite sure that I figured out how to get on the list. Uh, I had the same. I'm, I'm on the list to get mailings about calls and things, but whatever the group discussion was that Christy opted out of, I didn't see. No, the one you're on is the right one, because um, there's a Google group that you're on, which is the updates, which I'm using right now for, hey, here's the next couple calls. It happens to be a conversational Google group. And so if any of you want to post to it, go for that. You're, on the, you're in the right place. So um, Gene, when you're on Inside Jerry's Brain, uh, ba -da -ba -da. Uh, there we go, sorry. 
um, you know what? I buried it. Uh, if you go down below the, our most recent Zoom, just above the patron, the Patreon link, it says get notified of upcoming conversations. That link will get you in the conversation. That one. Okay. So I need to bring that up higher. Sorry, I, I buried it. I just redesigned the page a bit and in doing so managed to hide how to join the, the conversation. Not smart. Any other, um, any other thoughts? I really want to talk about emotional reasoning with the group. Just, just put yeah. it on the list. Um, why don't we, uh, so there's a spreadsheet I'm maintaining with topics for future calls. Why don't I put it on that? And if you'd like, we can chat offline briefly about how to frame it or what you mean and count me in. Yeah. Um, what I mean by it is that, you know, it'd be sort of like, why is there emotion? How does emotion how does emotional reasoning actually benefit animals, us, you know, and I think it's going to play into our discussion about belief systems and some of the manipulation here. For sure. In for particular, sure. for yeah. sure. That was an understatement. <laughs> um, and I am just doing a quick uh, brain share at the end because I have this thought in my brain <clears throat> which I think you might nod your heads at a bit, but you know, it's under well, a decision. Uh, the other, the other thing is that I think it's really dangerous if we, well, first of all, I don't know how to characterize Trump. I think he's actually crazy. And I actually mean that in a technical sense. Okay. But, but uh, I think it's dangerous for liberals, for progressives to focus too much on Trump. I think we're missing a whole, I mean, yes, you know, he is a terrible influence, you know, all these things about him. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but we need to look at the other things that are going on and not just invent a theory of a people or a small coterie causing this shift to the right. Look at some of the darkness in the left that is being very authoritarian too, and who thinks that they know exactly what's good for the population and wants to manipulate them for all the right reasons. Right. You know, um, those are the voices that scare me on both sides. They're, they're both dictatorships in the making. They, they, they both want to discard the experiences and the values of a lot of human beings on earth. And, and, and prescribe for them. And it, it offends me in a bunch of ways. Um, Anyone anyway. else with a closing thought? I think Kirsty's right. I think there's a lot of um, discomfort in humanity that's creating momentum in dangerous directions. Yes. And Agreed. I don't know how we would frame that, but that's a topic worthy of some deep diving. That sounds great. And for everybody, if you want to take something like that and frame it as a, as a topic and a, you know, a, a, a pithy question with a paragraph of what you mean, that goes straight into becoming a, a call and we, we, we go run that. So, um, or, or just post your ruminations on it. I, you know, how about this? Can we, you know, refine it as a group? Happy to do all that. How often do you do these? Um, right this minute, kind of two a week, maybe three a week. I had a cold for the last week, so I didn't okay. do as many. Um, ne next week, there's kind of two or three calls booked that I'm about to send out some announcements for um, from conversations with different people about different topics that are of interest. So that's, that's already, you know, going into next week. But I'd be happy, you know, I don't know. If this, if I had another zero on my Patreon account, I would do this um, twice a day. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, because I would love to be like Justin.tv and be a live stream, actual live stream of thinking through these things, sorting them out, bringing people in and out of the conversation, uh, posting it, <clears throat> and, 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 you know, lather, rinse, repeat. I would love to do that. Um, so right now it's experimental mode. These are just a couple a week. Um, it, it can very easily um, scale up a bunch. So thank you all. Um, this has been really, really fun. I completely love the conversation. 
Uh, password to anybody who ought to be in the next ones. Get them on the Inside Jerry's Brain list, and we'll see you at the next call and on the list. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>